David Storing, uh, Director at Martin Company, heading up sustainability. And I'm Joe Morris, um, one of the sort of founding namesake, I suppose, of Morrison Company. Tell me a little bit about, about your attitude to sustainability. What's your approach? We've set ourselves really ambitious targets, setting out um, early adopters to the Architects Declare, then um, uh, Retrofit First, and also to the RBA 2030 Challenge. So really early on, we're setting these really high ambitions, and then we've been you know, over the last couple of years we've been really trying to unpack that and understand how we can actually start to meet those targets and how we can make change in the industry. Um, and we've set up a, a green team to do that in the practice. Um, we've also kind of, in a way, we're trying to approach it from many, many angles because the problem is so multifaceted and actually the only solution is to kind of throw everything that we have at it. Um, and that goes from, to say, a green team dedicated looking at how we um, approach on every single project, um, uh, developing a series of tools within the practice so that we can understand um, embodied carbon in the materials that we select through to understanding daylight and, and how we design and how we can utilise that. And then in the practice we have um, two uh, certified passive house designers. So kind of, and then, and then I think actually what's, what's, what's gone from um, kind of these, setting these targets, we're now at a position where I feel it's coming directly together with every design decision that we're making. I think previously we would have been, you know, talking about selecting a colour of a brick, of a brick but now actually, you know, we we're saying should we even be designing in brick? So there's kind of, it's, it's now feels like it's much more ingrained in the process and actually, you know, it's, 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 it's how it all comes together, it's how we design, it's not almost a separate thing. So, what should you be, des be designing in, you know, timber, metal, concrete, stone, brick, you've got a number of choices, where, 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 how do they sit in your range of favourites? So I think this is, this is a kind of an, an ongoing debate uh, we have in the practice. <laughs> heated, uh, debate. <laughs> heated, very heated. You know, we come from a, a practice that's sort of deeply set in, um, in, in its surroundings, its context, it's a London surrounding, which is kind of brick, and that's about, you know, our phenomenological reaction to bricks, uh, their kind of size, their scale, their human nature versus the kind of monumental. So, and, but what we've done is we've looked really at the data on it and at the moment brick, as we know, sits in a very bad place in terms of embodied carbon. Um, I, think, I think, you know, what, what stri what's struggling at the moment is that it's a changing feast. Um, everyone's promising, um, you know, a, a lower embodied carbon brick by Etc. Etc. But the, I think the problem we really have is that we design the design process is so slow, and yet things and in industry are changing so fast. It's really hard to know mm. actually where we're going to be because I suppose to give an example, by utilising a uh, kind of let's say a sort of spreadsheet approach to material materials that we select, we've gone you know we've often been looking at options with concrete, utilising lots of cement replacement. But actually, the future of that, in terms of being able to source all of those replacements, looks to not to be able to continue on that vein. I think there's a slight sort of worry that you know buildings right now that are you know proclaiming to be low carbon by using lots of cement replacement become this new kind of um, people looking to those as, as a way to build in the future. But actually, you know, further down the line, we're not going to be able to get those cement replacements, and actually, it was potentially the wrong the wrong route. So you know, we design something now. But actually, when it comes to be procured, it's a different it's a different um, environment that it's in. So, what about stone? Web Yates have been doing some interesting work on that. Yeah. Yeah. Stone. Now, interestingly, we're in the midst of a competition where um, we're sort of thinking that would be the kind of perfect tool, per perfect kind of ingredient to sort of carve out space. Um, but I think it's the, it's a kind of slightly too narrow position or too, slightly too narrow question in a way because I think. There's a whole range of other things or kind of ingredients and plates which go into working out how a building should start to come together. And obviously form is another thing, so it's not as easy just to say it's made of a particular material, it's, 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 it's chassis and framework is in a particular way. Actually there's a whole envelope question, you know, go back to passive house standards and passive house systems, how you position a building, how you orientate it is, is changed, how you ventilate the building is changed, where the heat is gained and lost has to have a really profound impact on the kind of the way that you think about the building as a mould as well and then there are materials which are 
better or worse are in terms of the kind of overall operational and environmental performance of the building. So, you know, it's and, it, and it's complex through greater ideas about durability, about circularity, about demountability, about waste, about managing quality control. Um, so it's, it's a vast and complex soup, and I think I think it'd be fair to say that as a practice, I still feel like we're kind of only a couple of rungs on that ladder trying to really understand what the future of our work looks like. And, but we're very aware of having to change our approach and change the kind of methods that we've employed historically to, to date about how we think about buildings uh, in order to kind of find a new language. There's, a, there's an intrinsic, I guess, an intuitive uh, common sense approach to it, that any kind of variation in surface and volume equals a net negative if you get my drift, impact sort of thing. Um, so, but at the same time, we need variation, we need form in order to generate interest and articulation. So it's a sort of dichotomy between, you know, a, in one sense, tackling planet-centric um, uh, uh, solutions or, or, or coming up with planet-centric solutions, which basically simplifies buildings um, and creates them as this idea. I think, you know, Simon Orford often talks about this idea of ty typology blindness. In, in, in architecture, that actually what we should be building is ultimately continuously durable, flexible and adaptable buildings, regardless of programme. And therefore you sort of say, in one sense, and, and I really like that, this idea that buildings continuously change and therefore you've got to set up in terms of its grid and infrastructure and its environment and engineering it has to kind of have that in mind. At the same time, what that sort of tends to do is sort of, you, you, by, by default, you're almost squeezing out joy squeezing out kind of human spirit and endeavour and innovation, I suppose, and the potential that complexity does bring in terms of adding animation and interest and narrative to, to projects. So we're definitely on our line. We're trying to find on every project now, which I guess is, was very much secondary to the way that we thought in the past. Uh, you know, lots of the buildings we see here, there's a lot of narrative and form making, and as David says, sort of context giving or context taking um, but I think the future doesn't feel like it's as simple as that anymore and therefore buildings might have to go through a slightly kind of a slight phase of perhaps just being a little bit uglier as a, uh, by, by virtue of the fact that they're tackling other more complex issues and they probably take a greater um, importance in a hierarchy of decision making. Flexibility, long life, loose fit is too boring. Well it might be to the current the way of thinking, I guess, in terms of what people expect. So, you know, we sit in lots of our um, meetings with, um, you know, planning officers, design officers. We just had a really major one before you came today. And um, the officer saying, more articulation, more change, more drama, da, da, da. And we know that every time you do that, again, there's another impact in terms of more carbon, in terms of its, the construction, as in the embodied carbon, to build those complex shapes. And ultimately, there's a less efficient output, which requires a greater in degree, a degree of energy input through the life of the building. So who's to say which one is wrong or right? And I guess that's what I'm getting at. It's sort of, it, you, you, we are definitely in a world where we're having to think about sort of simplification and adaptability, as I say, and durability, rather than bespoke uh, and, and, and sort of shape making, I guess. And David, you wrote during COVID about the, the, the revolution and the change of the workplace. That revolution you saw then, is that a permanent revolution, do you think? Or are we going to go back to old habits and times? So, so I think in terms of, you know, where we, where, when I wrote that was, was in the midst of, of the pandemic. You know, for, for X amount of years before, we'd been, for, you know, let's say forced to be at our desk at a certain time um, and, and to leave it. Um, and to not work remotely, we were suddenly then forced into a scenario where we had to work remotely. Um, and then we've been jumping backwards and forwards between sometimes remotely, sometimes not. And we're now, I think, in, in this hybrid version, which I think is um, embryotic still. I think it's, you know, there's, there's people who've moved out of the city who are, some are realising it's working, some it isn't. Um, so we, we haven't enforced people to come back into the office. I think this has been quite critical in the way that we approach things through an iterative way. Yeah. Um, and I think that this, you know, this return to the office or return to this hybrid um, has to be something that will take a long time to, 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 to make it work. Um, the kind of model of always having to be in the office at your desk 
took a long time to yeah. work, and I think this kind of said that maybe there was something that wasn't quite working. So yeah, we haven't enforced a sort of mandatory amount of time in the office, um, and whereas other other practices have, and actually I think it's I've you know potentially created some conflict. Yeah, I think it's just worth adding though, just just again for the question, it's like what we've got to what we've got to remember is that you know we all went through this kind of incredible kind of upheaval and um, never before tried before. So again, I think you know I've said in in pieces as well that it's like the kind of it's a global. On a, on a global scale, never, be, never before done or seen or probably ever to happen again, social experiment. Can we effectively be as creative, uh, be as kind of dynamic as individuals, as society, as kind of, you know, workers and colleagues from our bedroom, doing effectively a similar sorts of um, outputs that we did before? And actually what we've realised is that there are definitely certain aspects of the daily uh, routine which can function anywhere, and if that's in a bedroom or a kitchen or in the office, then so be it. But there are definitely some aspects of the working uh, sort of day or your routine which really almost demand in person. Uh, and again, we're just giving enough scope for people just to work that out themselves. And half of the reason why you know setting up the op- our new office and mastery is about us sort of softly promoting the office so that we're encouraging people to use it by virtue of creating a set of facilities which are way better than anything else. So you've got to sort of wake up in the morning and think, is it better for me to be in the office? And you, you know, we're hoping that nine times out of ten the answer is yes. And we've got a decent take up at the moment. We've probably got at least 50 to 60% of the offices in daily. And we're 60 odd people in, in London. So that's you know, 30, 40 people in the office. And that feels about right, right now. And what's that done to the office? Because you've got a, a public space, there's one in this office, which is... Yeah. Obviously, very accessible to yeah. a wider group. I mean, the big, well. the big, the big thing about the. I mean, you know, David and I have probably spent out of all the team, uh, and there's another guy called Luke spent most of the time working this thing through. Um, it sort of came back to a vision statement that the management team wrote about a year and a half ago, two years ago, about wanting to bring architecture to the street. And again, it feels so cliche, but I guess seem to us that there aren't many practices that genuinely do it. I can think of, you know, Lights of Allies and Morrison and so forth, where there's a window and, you know, um, Peter Barber's kind of workshop, you know, front. But I don't think any of them really promote kind of a threshold access into the heart of the business rather than into a foyer. And I think that's what we're trying to do here is that we're trying to kind of create a space that lots of different people can use. So we've had loads of events. In fact, I've seen you at a couple uh, where it's sort of an opportunity for it not to be about the practice as well, so we sort of strip ourselves away from it, and whoever's hosting in our space is, is at the forefront of that. And the idea being there that, you know, we're bringing kind of real important issues and subjects to a local street, which is, you know, it's like back of nowhere in a way, kind of Mare Street, it's a sort of very busy thoroughfare, not much going on, lots of cars and bikes and the odd people, but there's still a community here, there's still a lot of people that live here, and there's a broad demographic of people, you know, rich in its diversity, um, and by just shoving a load of models in a window and opening the windows up and showing the stuff happening here, actually what we have is at real interaction daily. So people walking up and down these windows, stopping and looking, lots of people waving in the windows, waving back, looking at models. And to me, that feels really positive. Um, so this is what this is all about. We're going to be doing a lot of that, a lot of workshops, a lot of kind of community engagement, hiring a space out, gifting it for free um, to sort of charities and school organisations as well to try to bring the idea of architecture, food as well, with a sort of restaurant next door, uh, education and outreach all together in a kind of symbiosis. And so what impact do you think all that is going to have on London as a whole? Um, Does it reinforce centres like this? Is it bad for the City of London, West End? Are they going to lose that, do you think, in this sort of shift that's happening? I mean, what do you think, John? I mean, I can. I'll start. I think decentralising is good. I think you know, spreading the word is a is a strong message. I think there are enough uh, cultural institutions uh, to to kind of you know plug a lot of gaps across London, and there are enough people, there are enough organisations, enough businesses, practices from small to large um, to basically cover a lot of London to kind of spread a message. And we we know, for example, around here uh, that you know. Having grown up in Clerkenwell for 30 years, you know, that's my entire career has been spent there. That where Clerkenwell was before it got to where it is now, it was a wasteland. Um, in, the, in the true sense, it's kind of post industrial in a way, 
not really much going on. A lot of um, antisocial behaviour, crime, m- many of the buildings in disrepair, and now look at Clarkmont as a sort of, you know, it's a sort of, I don't know, it's a sort of celebration of everything that good evolution and development of city looks like. And it kind of, we, I guess we want to be part of that as well. We want to be continuously pushing the frontier and not, not in a kind of general, you know, not gentrifying in a way, but actually being really authentic and still being, you know, actual people in an actual place and reaching out and bringing people in. And I think, to my mind, you know, revealing it is a really strong message. It, it tries to remove a sort of cynicism and a, and a secretive sort of nature of architecture and, you know, the kind of, a sort of capitalist sort of ugliness of, of development and try to disseminate it and gift it to a lot of people. So what are the sort of key projects you've got going through the office at the moment? Gosh, I mean, there are so many. Um, I, I mean, I, I, it's probably worth just dwelling on this idea of um, all this sort of, a kind of le- where we are, I guess, what it looks like to be kind of a, in, in Morrison Company and where we've come from, you know, with our kind of legacy. Um, you know, we, we, we're very much going through a kind of transition from a, from a certain scale and a certain sort of typology of work um, to a much sort of larger scale and a sort of, there's a sort of slight sort of lag time, I guess, in, in terms of delivering projects which have a sort of five to ten, you know, ratio increase in scale and complexity from where we've come from before. So it feels like it's a lot of, we're at the beginning of lots of things, um, whilst at the same time delivering off some of the kind of mid-scale uh, projects that we are part of our legacy. So, for example, we've just just about finished with a few tweaks here and there on a, on a rooftop pavilion, um, 110,000 square foot net of office space, a reinterpreted sort of Victorian um, warehouse uh, for Dermot London on City Road, which David was the, the lead for. Um, we've got a, a health centre down um, in Aylesbury on the Aylesbury Master Plan not a million miles away from our um, elephant, um, uh, you know, elephant castle energy hub building. Um, that's a sort of 23, 24 million pound new build a health centre, community infrastructure and as a nursery on the roof. Probably in Q2 next year, Q2, sort of 2023. Um, we've got uh, one of the leanest office buildings which Stanhope have ever delivered, if not the leanest, um, on the television centre. That's a 10,000 square foot net of um, you know, HQ office building, and then at a different scale, way more complex is our work on Blossom Street, um, Lord Folgate, with British Land, um, collaborating with HMM, DSDHA, East Stanton Williams, um, and that has that that literally is a sort of lens on the character of each individual brick in a kind of you know historical restorative process. So you know, lots of scales and shifts and whatever. And then coming in the background of that, we've got you know more health centres, much larger scale housing. You've got stuff on Old Kent Road, stuff over in Poplar for, for Eco World. Um, lots of kind of HQ scale sort of workplaces. But what we're trying to do with those is build an idea of um, a thing we've called Coined Office Plus, which is about being able to deliver at the kind of um, the metrics which most developer landlords are looking for in terms of you know scale efficiency. Um, and sort of rationalism and logic, but doing it really, really efficiently to enable a kind of much wider program of other things to happen. So, which is kind of what Mayor Street's about, you know, how do you create opportunity for serendipity, for interaction, connection to the city? How do you make sure that amenity isn't sort of a bolt on, but actually integrated fully into it, which builds in by affiliate, and then, you know, the idea of technology and, you know, post occupancy. All these projects are playing at that kind of new territory. So, We've got you know projects in Clerkenwell, uh, projects in uh, Shoreditch, for example, all major bits of built in city infrastructure, entire blocks, um, which uh, we're currently in sort of stage three, stage four, or planning stage as well. And then what else we've got on at the moment? Hotel Camden. Yeah, some hotels, student housing, quite quite a bit of student housing, um, and kind of unusual project up in uh, Haringey as part of the warehouse district, <coughs> just to kind of reimagine how you build a new warehouse for warehouse living which is kind of hybrid live work um, which is for an artist community for an artist community yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah great well thank you very much there you go yeah. <laughs> yeah. not so simple <laughs>